All right. Good morning, everybody. Glad you're here. Glad you braved the elements to be here this morning on this beautiful first Sunday, 2022. I think just the fact that we survived the last two years is cause for celebration. Cause for, yes, cause for celebration with that. Um, I wish I could promise you that this year is going to be different. However, after the past two years, I think I've learned my lesson. So we're just going to we're just going to go with hoping that it's going to be better and different, not with any kind of promises made with that. Um, if, if you got the email earlier, we've gone back to let's keep our mask on just through this current wave that it seems with Omicron. Our numbers in the state are, are going through the roof just like everything else. So we're doing that. We have the air, air filters in place as well, maintaining distance, especially if you see someone with a mask on. Uh, make sure you put yours on before you approach them with that. We'll probably be doing that. I mean, as always, we've been guided by our healthcare professionals and the guidance of, of uh, the government stuff on that. So we'll be monitoring that as far as our practice. We are going to still approach the table for communion. Just give yourself space between yourself and the person who's in front of you as you approach the table when we do um, communion. Along with that, hopefully you did see that letter, that email that went out. There is a year-end letter in there. Uh, it kind of talks about where we're going, what we're doing. I hope that we will have a, a more extended time as a church family to get together, talk through kind of our goals, our aspirations, the things that we're going to do in this coming year. Uh, look for that soon. But in the meantime, please, if you haven't read the year-end letter, take time to do that. That gives a good idea kind of where we're at, where we're going with that. Um, with that said, let's spend a little time praying here as, uh, as we start this new year. I know there's a lot of things as I encounter and talk to people. Obviously, we just mentioned it, the, the surge in COVID cases, although, praise God, they seem not to be as intense um, in that, but there's just more of them. So we still need to take that very seriously. Um, and along with that, continue to pray just for our essential workers, our hospital workers, our educators, uh, the people in the schools, um, everybody who has to be there has to be in close environments with other people. Uh, we really want to continue to lift them up to pray for them as we do. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to lead us in this time of prayer. Um, is it, well, and is there anything else specifically people thinking about have to pray for as we go? Okay, so Alyssa, we'll, we'll add Alyssa in there for sure. Stacy. Yes. Yeah, those who are seeking housing and without housing, this is, a, this is a very demanding time. And it looks like it's not going to get any warmer anytime soon. So we'll definitely pray for that. Anything else? Okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lead us in the, in the prayer for that, and then we're going to go straight into the Lord's Prayer. So when I start the Our Father, let's just all stand up, and we'll pray that together, and then turn it over to Alex and Jeff and everybody to, for our worship. Let's just take a minute. Take a deep breath. Let it out. Maybe open your hands as a sign of letting go the things we're holding on to, maybe the things that are trying to hold on to us, and also the willingness to receive from God what is to come. God, here we are, another year. You have sustained us and encouraged us. You have gathered us and brought us this far. And we give thanks for that. That in the midst of unimaginable challenges that all of us are facing collectively and many of us are facing individually, you are with us. You have not abandoned us or forsaken us. You continue to seek after us, even when we 
want it to have nothing to do with you. You seek us. And you seek our well-being even when we seem set on our own self-destruction. Thank you, God. Have mercy on those that are suffering from this recent wave of COVID infections, but also those who are serving those who are suffering, our healthcare professionals, all those who are in essential services to maintain our life, the supply chain, the economy, the things that are necessary for us. God, protect them, bless them, have mercy on them. And God, we pray for those who are without housing, who are facing these bitter temperatures and cold weather, wet weather. God, that you would have mercy and help us as a community respond as we should to reach out with mercy and sacrifice. We pray for Alyssa, one of our own, who is in a situation dealing with a roommate with COVID, that you would have mercy on both of them. Protect Alyssa, heal her roommate. And God, as we go into this new year as a church, we pray that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit. That your Holy Spirit would do His thing in us, through us, among us. That you would draw each of us closer to our true selves, to you, to each other. And that in the midst of the challenges, we would rest in you. We would lean into you. And we would know you more. To that end, we pray this together. Our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sinned against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let's go ahead and stay standing, and uh, because it is cold out, we might as well go ahead and expend a little energy, keep ourselves warm, and continue in that spirit of prayer as we sing these songs this morning of commitment and recommitment that fit well, I think, with the theme that we're going to hear. Surrender. 
Your glory, God, is what our hearts long to be overcome by your presence, Holy Spirit, you are welcome, Spirit, you are welcome. To be overcome by your presence, Lord. Amen. It's not only worship, but it's prayer. It's definitely my prayer for today that the Holy Spirit would flood this place. Uh, welcome. If you're watching on Facebook Live or listening to the podcast, my name is John Ray. This is Grace Church of Northwest Arkansas. We're really glad you're listening. Really glad you braved the elements to be here. Good to see you. It's already started, though, hasn't it? <clears throat> the tsunami wave of ads and enticements to start afresh for the new year. New diet, new body, new you for the new year. All you have to do is click here, buy this, join this, read this, watch this. Sure, they want your money, but what they want first is your attention. Because they know if they have your attention, the money will follow. They know if they have your attention, they have you. So what I want to ask, and it actually confused a few people as it went out the, the title this week, is to stop paying attention. Stop giving mental real estate to all the ads, the enticements, the amusements. Stop paying attention and choosing the distractions and systems of consumables and self-centering. Of course, that's easy to say, right? It's easy to say right now when it's kind of like the start of school, the new year. I, know, I don't know, Lindley, Lorelai, like y'all know this with New Year's yet, but like for adults, New Year's is kind of like the first day of school. It's kind of like we get the new notebook. We get to open the new pack of paper. We get all our new pens and we put them in, right? It's kind of how it feels in New Year's, right? Oh, man, I, I, it's full of possibilities. Got a, got a few new clothes for Christmas I can wear to my first day class, you know? We get that feeling. But we also know the last day of school feels very different than the first day, right? Like the last day, you're done, over with, want out of here, let me out of this school, we kind of inevitably know that this feeling, whatever it is, is, is going to pass. Pretty soon, it's going to be December 31st, 2022. Sooner than we realize it. And we're going to be looking back and going, whoa, whoa, what happened? Where did I, where did I spend 365 days? Where did, I, where did I invest my attention? Where did I invest my energy, my imagination? We're probably going to have some regret with that. We're probably going to feel some remorse, some loss. And then we're going to go, but hey, it's a new year. It's a new year. Let's start all over, right? We get caught up in this. We talk about a lot here, this try harder, give up cycle. This endless cycling of Regret and then intention and then regret and then intention. So when I ask you to stop paying attention to those things, when I say, hey, look, let's set aside the, the distractions. Let's set aside these, this uh, mindset of just constant consumption and entertainment. I, I'm standing here in need of the same thing. I'm not standing here saying, hey, follow me because I've done this. I've figured it out. The John Ray School of Enlightenment. Sign up now. You'll get three free months 
It's nothing like that. Maybe I may be the worst at this. I'm so easily distracted. I'm so easily prone to chasing rabbits. As a matter of fact, sometimes I think that's my job is chasing rabbits. So what do we do? Is this just another impossible thing that some guy in religious garb or, or with a religious position is telling you to do that you can't do? Some unattainable goal, platitude, that hey, if you were holy, you know, if you really were a Christian, you would do this. Is it just another burden that's being put upon you to produce guilt and shame? Weight and heaviness, is that it? Because it can feel that way. It can feel that way, right? Like, oh, great, one more sermon, one more encouragement to be perfect with God. Well, usually I get up here and tell you I don't know the answer. I say that a lot. I don't, I don't, there's a lot of things I don't know. This one I think I got an answer for us. Yes. It's just that the answer isn't easy, okay? The answer is going to take practice, but I really do think it is an answer, a way forward in the midst of this. We're going to be talking about Jesus setting tables for people as we go into this through the rest of the winter, into the spring. We're going to look at how God interacts around the table not just this table, but our kitchen table, the table in the restaurant, the table in the wilderness even. And one of the most perfect pictures of that table is in Psalm 23, but it even goes beyond that. So I want, I want us to read Psalm 23 because I think here's the, here's the answer. Is if we're not, I'm just going to give it to you straight and we'll talk about how that works out. If we don't understand what we already have in Jesus, if we don't take time to really appreciate, meditate on, practice the the power and presence of God's provision in our life, how's that for three Ps? Um, We're not going to get anywhere. So instead of starting from the position of, okay, I lack these things, therefore I need to do these things to get these things, We need to reverse that. And we need to start from the position of, I have these things. They have already been given to me. What I need to do is practice nurturing them. Practice being aware of them. Practice giving attention to them. And I want you to think about that as you hear the words of Psalm 23. So Psalm 23 says, The Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. Now, this is the NET version. He takes me to lush pastures. He leads me to refreshing waters. He restores my strength. He leads me down the right paths for the sake of his reputation. Even when I must walk through the darkest valley, I fear no danger. And listen to the change. It's talking about God. Now it's talking to God. I fear no danger for you are with me. Your rod and your staff reassure me. You prepare a feast for me in the plain side of my enemy, this table, this feast. You refresh my head with oil. My cup is completely full. Surely your goodness and faithfulness will pursue me all the days of my life, and I will live in the house of the Lord forever. That is provision that has already been made. That is not a give us this daily bread. That is, look at the daily bread that has been given to you. Reflection. That is a recognition and a paying attention to what God has already provided, what God is already doing with that. Dallas Willard writes, and it's it's one of my favorite books, and I hate the cover with all my heart. It's called A Life Without Lack. I even hate the title of the book because it sounds like one of these prosperity gospel things. It really does. And the the cover, it's awful. Anyway, it looks like a Joel Osteen book. Bless him. Um, And Dallas Willard is the furthest thing from Joel Osteen there is, I think. But he writes, this, he writes this book about a life without lack, and it's all a meditation on Psalm 23. And he made, the pre, he made the practice of praying Psalm 23 every day. I have renewed the practice just recently 
Um, I don't know if it's just age or what, but I usually wake up around 3 a.m. every morning. It just happens. I know. You got that to look forward to. Um, and, my, and, and the temptation is to reach for the phone. Anybody else? Keep the phone by your bed, right? Wake up, 3 a.m., can't. Oh, I'll just check real quick. Swipe, click, check, swipe, like, check, repost, like, check. All of a sudden, it's 5 a.m. So in order to stop paying attention to that, one of the things that I've started doing is praying Psalm 23 when I wake up. It's just repeating it. It helps me resist the temptation to pick up the phone. Dallas Willard, he, he paraphrased Psalm 23 this way. He said, the Lord is my shepherd. I have a life without lack. Thus the name of the book. I get it. In his green pastures, I've eaten my fill, so I lie down. At his still waters, my thirst is satisfied. He heals and regenerates my broken depths in his eternal life, so I can walk in paths of righteousness on his behalf. Even though I go through loss, hunger, disease, aging, and death, I will fear no evil, because you, Jesus, are with me. Your strong rod and protective staff put me at liberty. Your abundant provision is a feast for me, so I'm happy to share with my enemies. You give me hot showers and warm, fluffy towels, joyful experiences and deep relationships to make me feel clean, special, and powerful. My cup runs over so I can be generous without ever running out. Surely this world is a perfectly safe place for me because I dwell and abide with God in the fullness of of his life in the kingdom of the heavens forever. Isn't that awesome? That's included in our learning guide this week. So I want to ask you, invite you, memorize one version. Maybe the, maybe do Dallas's version. Maybe you just do part of it. Maybe it becomes a mantra for the new year. Right? You give me hot showers and clean, fluffy towels. How's that for praying scripture with that? But take part of that. You see, because the big idea here is paying attention to, becoming aware of God's presence and provision for us is essential to living a flourishing life. When we pay attention, we find we have all we need. And we find out if our desires, our estimations, our imaginations are properly ordered. You see, when we start to realize that we have been given all these things, then we start to think about the things that we're worried about, fixated about, fearful of. We go, well, is that right? Is it good that I should be fearful of that? Is it good that I should be fixated on that? Is it good that I should be doing these other things? I use the illustration on Christmas Eve of the, the Moorish people, the group of three Moorish men who were brought to France at the turn of the last century and shown all the great wonders of that Paris had to offer the Eiffel Tower and the, the river boats on the Seine and all these things and how they were totally unimpressed. Except when they were taken out in the countryside and they were shown a waterfall. And it blew them away. It brought them to tears. These men who had brought up, been brought up for centuries, generations through living in the desert, they weren't impressed by towers and boats and planes, but water, life-giving water, brought them to their knees and almost worship, tearful response. I think that's a good illustration for us. I think that's a way to understand the world. Um, I've been reading about the desert mothers and fathers recently, and okay, so here's your, we're starting the, wor we're starting the new year with your big seminary words, all right? Here's your two big seminary words. Um, Agrippina, Agrippina, Ag Agrippina, Agrippina, that's it. Agrippina and apathia. So the desert mothers and fathers, when they went out into the deserts and they renounced all the, the luxuries of the world and they lived very solitude, lives of solitude and scarcity, they were practicing this thing of apathia. We get the word ap apathy from this, but it's really not apathy in, the, in that sense. It was basically a conscious rejection of paying attention to things. In a way, they were like the Moors who would stand before the Eiffel Tower and go, so what? 
Like they would look at the riches, they would look at the things that would call them, they would look at, at the, the promise of power or prestige or, or wealth or luxury or ease, and they would just go, no thank you. And they would turn away from it. They wouldn't think about it. They would consciously reject paying attention to those things. Now, if I stopped there, this would be a good Zen Buddhist sermon. Because that's the idea of Zen Buddhism, is this idea of detachment. That, that it, the source of all our pain comes from attaching to things, comes from loving things, comes from wanting things. And that the path to enlightenment, the path to truth, is to detach. And they're half right. They're half right. And, and I'd say this not dismissively. I think there's a lot to learn from understanding that impetus to detach, to let go. But the Christian message says, yes, detach from those things. Detach from those things that, that claw at us, that clamor for us, that pull at us but not for the sake of detachment. It's so that we can properly attach to the proper thing in the proper way. And that's this second part. This is the, uh, the agripnia. The agripnia actually is it's crazy. It's where we get the word insomnia from. And it's this idea of being so watchful, so aware, so awake, that we actually can't sleep. That we're so captivated, we're so tuned into, we're so locked onto that we can't even close our eyes with that. And this is where this is where Christianity fills out that that invitation of Buddhism to to detach. Christianity says, "Yes, we have to." Right? We see this again, and again in the in the scriptures. Love not the things of the world and the ways of the world. Right? Let go of these things. Take up your cross. Follow me. Yes, there are all these calls to those sorts of things, but it is always in conjunction with so that you can then love what is good. Walk humbly. Seek mercy. Do justice. Be passionate for the things that are good and true and beautiful. Detachment's not the answer alone. Detachment is a means to an end to this proper ordering of things. And this starts, this starts with this understanding that we already have everything that we need. Please, don't start this year thinking about all you lack. Thinking about all you want. Start by thinking what you already have. Now, how do we live into that? You see, paying attention to the right things means not paying attention to all the distractions. To stop paying attention to them, not so much because they're wrong or bad, although there are certainly those things that are wrong and bad we shouldn't pay attention to, okay? Don't, don't do that. But stop paying attention to clear the space, to make room for the discomfort, Make room for the discomfort, the disorientation, the boredom necessary to refocus, to reorient, and, re and to pay attention to the ultimate things. Listen, I'm, I, I'm, not gonna, I'm not saying this is easy. We are, we are not only, listen, there's chemical processes that happen when we get in the habit of click, clicking and swiping and liking. Like, it, it, it's not just a mental thing we need to stop. There are physiological ruts that get established, habits that get established in our bodies. Those don't just go away overnight. It's not like take one Psalm 23 and call me in the morning. Like, it doesn't work that way. It takes practice. But it's always, it has to start from the idea that we've already got it. We just need to live into it. It's already there. We just need to bring it forth. We just need to give it room to grow, to nurture, to flourish with that. I wrote this in my journal yesterday morning as I was reflecting on a, a new year. 
And this is about paying attention. I was writing about paying attention. I said, this is all I really want. And it is also all I really dread. Look, there are some dang good reasons not to pay attention to God. It's scary. W.H. Auden, in one of his famous poems called The Age of Anxiety, he wrote this. He said, we would rather be ruined than be, than be changed. We would rather die in our dread than climb the cross of the moment and let our illusions die. We'll just let that sink in for a minute. We would rather be ruined than be changed. We would rather die in our dread than climb the cross of the moment and let our illusions die. Paying attention is scary. Paying attention to the right things, that is. The ancient writers often called it the terrible love of God. We really, really start to understand how much God loves us. We really under, start to understand the lengths God has gone to pursue us. We really start to really, really pay attention to that. It is, it undoes us. It undoes, literally undoes us, unwinds us, strips us bare takes away all our illusions, all our conceits, all our selfishness, all our self-centeredness. And y'all, we love that stuff. We love that stuff. That's why, that's why that it's so easy. It's played to us. It's marketed to us. This self-centeredness, this constant consuming of self. Because it's easier than looking at who we really are, what we really want, what we're really made of with that apart from God. So paying attention is scary with this. But this is what it's all about. It's about learning, not earning. We already have it. It's so much easier to set it up as another self-help process. God saved this church from being another self-help program. From being another place where you can come get a little dose of religion to make yourself feel good about yourself. God save me from that. Save us from that. It's not about earning. It's so much easier to make this, hey, I'm going to go to church and I'm going to give this. I'm going to trade this. I'm going to give them my, your, my attention or my money or my song or my thing and then I'll get this in return. This transactional way of doing it. It's just another self-help project. Can we quit the arrogant assertion that we have it all figured out? That we get to decide who's in and who's out? Can we please give up the endless self-help, self-centered spirituality that says we will only participate when it fits our fancy? Can we please let go of the vain imagination that we can do all of this alone? Or maybe just with a private, hand-selected group of people who will only affirm our decisions and our estimations and never challenge us. Can we please stop paying attention to these distractions? Instead, can we commit, can we understand and commit ourselves to the practices of worshiping together? learning together and serving together? Can we belong, become, and believe together? Can we understand that worship is a way of paying attention? So is hospitality and serving, work, play, and art, cooking and cleaning and eating, bike riding and walking, sex and study and sleep. All these things are ways of paying attention, but they're also terrific distractions, imitations, deceptions, when we do them for the wrong reason in the wrong way. 
It's not so much what we do, although that is important. It is important what we do. But it's not, it's not so much that that's important, but it's why we do it, how we do it, and who we do it with. Can we pay attention? Can we pay attention to God, to others, and as a result, ourselves? Not in our own strength, but by leaning into God and each other. The author Belden Lane said that paying attention both to God and to each other is all that ever really matters. I would add to that that when we pay attention to God and others, we start to pay attention to ourselves, but it's a result. It's a byproduct. It's very hard to really pay attention when we make ourselves the focus to pay attention to God and others. But when we do that, when we pay attention to God and others, we start to learn about ourselves as a byproduct. It's a way around this self-centered um, distraction that we put up with that. One of the devotionals from the Advent devotional that um, I've been following said this, so there is always a temptation to wait a little longer in the darkness. Believing that whenever we're ready, we'll be able to enter into the light. This is true for those waiting at the threshold of belief. And also for those Christians who are being called to move deeper in their journey of sanctification and devotion. I think this is why the author of Hebrews admonishes us, therefore... Since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, we must get rid of every weight, and I would add distraction, and the sin that clings so closely and run with endurance the race set out for us, keeping our eyes fixed or paying attention to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. As we study, as we look at this, the, the table that we talk about, the tables, the groups, the fellowships that we do, it's a significant way of paying attention. We're paying attention to others there. We're setting the table for others. We're being hospitable to others. It's an act of attention giving with that. And that's why we want to learn to practice these things. Again, we're, we're learning it. We're not earning. We're not getting brownie points or anything like that by doing it. We're just learning how to do it by practicing it with that. The table is one of the most significant signs of welcome, safety, inclusion, and healing that we have. Understanding what it means to be included at God's table is essential to understanding what it means to be a Christian. So we're going to practice that. We're going to give attention to it. And we're not going to wait. We're not going to wait because we, Jesus didn't wait. He didn't wait till we were perfect. He didn't wait till we had it figured out. He didn't wait till we had it all together. Let that sink in too, right? Jesus didn't come down because we finally got our stuff together. That we kindly, finally figured it out, that we finally prayed the right prayer. Matter of fact, the opposite. Seems to be Poem Sunday. I'm going to read you another poem. This one is my Madeline L'Engel. It's called First Coming. It's about Jesus. It says, He did not wait until the world was ready till men and nations were at peace. He came when the heavens were unsteady and prisoners cried out for release. He did not wait for the perfect time. He came when the need was deep and great. He dined with sinner, with sinners and all their grime, turned the water into wine. He did not wait till hearts were pure and joy. He came to a tarnished world of sin and doubt, to a world like ours of anguish, shame, he came, and his light would not go out. He came to a world which did not mesh. I love that illustration. It doesn't mesh. He came into this world that did not mesh to heal its tangles, shield its scorn. In the mystery of the word made flesh, the maker of the stars was born. We cannot wait till the world is sane to raise our songs with joyful voice. For to share our grief, to touch our pain, he came with love. Rejoice, rejoice. Ask the worship team to come back up. As we begin and prepare ourselves to respond to this.
And this is something that invites response. I want to say demands response, but I cannot demand anything. All I can do is invite. And ultimately, that's all God does is invites us. God never demands us. God never forces God's self on us. God is always inviting us, waiting, suffering, willing to take upon God's self the shame, the humiliation of being rejected, of being scorned, of being ignored. Can you imagine? Can you imagine the indignity of the God of the universe being ignored by us for some flash image that we swipe through? some paltry thing that we buy. God suffers that, waits and invites. He invites you now to the table, to the table to come and remember what has been done for us. His body broken, His blood poured out, the ultimate sign and sacrifice of that love. It's for us, y'all. It's free. You're here, you get to participate. How's that for a bargain? You don't have to do a thing. You just have to walk up and receive it. God's body, God's life given for us. We get, to, we get to participate in that at no cost at all. It's already there. The table's set. We just have to learn how to receive, how to walk that out. So thank you for being here. Thank you for making the effort. It's cold out there today. It'd be a lot easier to stay at home in front of the fire. Thank you for Oh.
Though the ground underneath you is cursed instead, your planting and reaping are never the same. Your labor is not in vain. Your labor is not unknown. Though the rocks they cry out and the sea it may grow, the plants of your toil may not seem like a home. Your labor is not unknown. I am with you. stand together and uh, sing this last song and uh, be reminded that he is with us. He is here. He was here long before we invited him to be here. <laughs> long before we realized we needed him.
If you're lonely, longing for someone to hear you If your burdens feel like more than you can bear 
If you're searching for a place to just be honest Come just as you are 